Today I want to talk to you about uh, standing upon the grace of God. This message is called, By Grace That We Stand. And of course, Romans has been called the gospel of grace. Paul has been called the apostle of grace. And it's just in everything that he talks about, the subject of grace comes up. And so it is here in Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Therefore... Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's um, put ourselves in a courtroom setting for a moment because sometimes when you wor use words like justified and grace and all this stuff, we hear those words so many times as Christians that sometimes we can just gloss right over it and it loses their, their power or their significance. So when we talk about being justified, it's a legal term. P picture yourself in the courtroom where, I don't know, how many of you have ever been to court? Let me see your hand. You know, maybe not for you. You were there for a friend. <laughs> and I just remember I was um, going through the whole jury process, and we went into the courtroom and got to the stage where they actually show, you know, who's on trial and it was this guy who was on trial for murder and he was just constantly had this tissue and he's just constantly wiping he couldn't stop crying and I'm like man the, that guy's in the hot seat and I'm over here on this side of this little stub wall it is a whole lot better being in this seat than in that seat because when you're in a court of law and the judge comes in, it's like, all rise. You, you show honor and respect because this man or woman has the authority to determine your future. And it's like, dang, this is some serious stuff. And that guy knew it was serious that day. Well, I want you to imagine the court of God where you're not on trial for a crime, but you're on trial for some moral offense. And all of us are guilty. When it comes to morality and holiness and being like God, we're all guilty. And there we sit in the guilty seat and the judge pronounces us justified. You can step down, you're free to go, the court no longer sees you as guilty, but as innocent. Not as one who has broken the law, but as one who has kept the law. What a gift, what a blessing to go from guilty to innocence. And Paul says that's all made possible through the blood of Christ, from the grace of God, and our faith in him. See, we're not saved by our works. It's our works that got us into this mess. We're saved by our faith in his work. That's the difference. You're made right with God, not because of how good you are, but because of how good he is. Not because of your works, but because of his works. He's the initiator, you're the responder. And so when you put your faith in the Lord and say, okay, if he's willing to take my spot on the guilty seat and he's the only holy one that has qualified to do this and he's willing to give me that plea bargain and, and pardon me, I'll take it. Because I believe in him a whole lot more than I believe in myself to be able to go out of this courtroom and now live a perfect life. So I'll take the plea bargain. Thank you, Jesus. But not everyone has that faith to trust in the Lord's ability to turn their life around. It's like they just want to keep, you know, look into themselves and they're so wrapped up in themselves and their pride won't let them have the humility to accept the pardon that's being offered. Susan and I were watching Cops the other day uh, on TV and this guy had been pulled over because he was screeching his tires and driving recklessly and the Cop, you know, approaches the window and says, you know what you were doing wrong? And the guy's all, yes, officer, I was peeling my tires and I'm trying to show off for my buddy here. And the, and the cop, you know, whenever you're honest and you just spill your beans, he's like, okay, good, you're going to deal straight with me. So 
the cop was really cool about it. He goes, I used to have a Grand Torino. I know all about it. You know, no, it's no big deal. Just let me see your license. And he got his license, and he went and ran it to make sure the guy's, you know, doesn't have a warrant out for his arrest or anything, right? He doesn't have any kind of a record. So the cop is talking to the camera saying, hey, this guy's just showing off. I'm going to cut him a break. He hasn't, doesn't have a record or anything. So he comes back to the window, and he, and he tells the guy, okay, you know, um, I'm going to give you back your license. Just, you know, make sure you, you calm down. And the guy all of a sudden just starts mouthing off. Just like won't shut up, just keeps talking. Well, you know, officer, I mean, before the guy was like, you know, owning up to his stuff. Now all of a sudden something's changed and he's just mouthing off to this officer. And uh, you can tell the officer was like, dude, if you just shut up, I'm about ready to let you go. You're kind of digging yourself a hole right now. Well, then, all of a sudden, the guy's mouthing off so much, he goes to give him his license back, and the guy's all, where's my wallet? You didn't give me your wallet, sir. You just gave me your license. No, I gave you my wallet. You have my wallet. And the cop goes, sir, have you been drinking tonight? A little bit. Well, how much have you had to drink? How many drinks have you had? Three. It's always two or three, right? Nobody's had like six. (laughs) I've had three drinks, and the cop is still being gracious to this guy. He's all, hey, I'll tell you what. You and your buddy pull your car around the corner, park it. You're going to walk home. The guy still wouldn't shut up. He just keeps mouthing off, won't humble himself, and accept the grace that's being showed to him. And as a result, the the guy's getting more belligerent, so the cop's finally like, dude, you left me no choice. I wanted to do it my way, which would be so much better for you, but you got to do it your way. You got to do it the hard way, so step out of the vehicle. They bring in a traffic cop to run the DUI test, and the guy's like, you know, take nine steps, heel the toe, and the guy's all ten. You know, and so you're going to jail. It's like the same thing with God. None of us are going to be able to walk that fine line our whole lives through. We're going to continually come up guilty before God. And if he's willing to cut us a break through Jesus, all we got to do is accept it. Lord, I trust in your goodness, not my own. Lord's all, that's all I need. Because now we can begin a relationship that's based upon me working in your life and not you just cutting me out of your life. And that's what I created you for, a relationship. So it's by faith. Faith, And when we put our faith in the Lord and we're justified and our sin is forgiven and it's dealt with, then we have peace with God, Paul says at the end of verse 1, and the peace of God. But not only that, look at verse 2. Through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Let's unwrap that for a second. Paul is talking about how that through our faith in Jesus, we have access into the grace of God. Now again, grace is a word that speaks of God's favor towards you, how he wants to bless you. When we talk about the grace of God, we're not just talking about the fact that God's willing to forgive you. He goes way beyond just forgiveness. He actually wants to favor you. He wants to pour out his blessings on you. He wants to be good to you. That's grace. That because of the Lord and his grace in our lives, not only do we not get what we really deserve, judgment, but we get what we don't deserve, God's blessing. That's how incredible grace is. That's how amazing grace is. And Paul says it's by this grace that we stand. In other words, this concept, I'm right with God because of his love for me and his goodness towards me, becomes your stability in life. It becomes the foundation upon which you can stand. How many of you know that we live in a changing world and things are always shifting? And man, it's it's scary sometimes. Like, what can you really count on? The thing that you can really count on is God's grace for you, God's love for you. That is the one thing that will never 
change. Can you give God praise for that this morning? But standing by grace, oh, we need that foundation because we live in a fallen world. I mean, things go downhill in this world. Since Adam's sin, there's a curse placed upon this earth. As the result, we have sin and sickness, disease and death. Man, things go downhill. And we live in a society where people try to put you down and Satan tries to take you down. I mean, it's true. Jesus wants you to have an abundant life. But it's also true that Satan wants to steal, kill, and destroy us. And every day there's this battle that rages on. But grace is what keeps us standing. Grace is what keeps us on our feet. Amen? Whenever life tries to label you a failure or bring out your past problems or, or classify you as a second-class citizen or an outcast, have you ever felt that way? Because you blew it, you're like, man, I'll, I'll, I'll never get to where I once was. And now people label me because of this, this thing that I did. I'm forever going to be an addict or I'm forever going to be a convict or whatever. That's not how God wants to view us, but that's kind of what we can go through. Maybe on a much more minor scale, you created some simple sin, but coming into church, you're like, man, can everybody see it written all over me that I did this last night or Friday night or whatever? And sometimes just like, man, is that how people are going to see me? And, and we just see ourselves through our own sin sometimes. But God's grace elevates us out of that and leads us into the abundance that God has for us instead of getting stuck and staying stuck in our past mistakes. Grace is what will make you stand. Grace will give you a new beginning. Grace will give you a new identity, a new value, and a new hope, all by the grace of God. Do you understand? Satan wants to keep you bound in your past. He wants to keep you in that guilty seat. And even after the judge sets you free and says, justified, just as if I'd never sinned, oh, what a gift, thank you, God. You leave the courtroom, you're jumping up and down, man, I'm free, it's dealt with, I don't have to worry about this being held against me ever again. And then Satan's right there going, yeah, but you don't deserve it. Don't you dare walk around like a free man when you and I both know you're guilty in your heart of hearts. Satan wants to hold you back and hold you down while Jesus wants to set you free and move you forward. And that's a battle that we all struggle with with different things that we've gone through. And so notice that we're not only pronounced not guilty, but we're favored. We're treated not just like someone in the courtroom who's been let go, but were adopted into the judge's own family. God the Father says, you're my kids. And I'm going to love you and look after you and bless you like my kids. You're accepted in the beloved. Highly favored, deeply loved, and greatly blessed. And I think just as people, we go through so much junk in this world, you have to say to yourself over and over again, I am highly favored, deeply loved, and greatly blessed. Say that with me. I am highly favored, deeply loved, and greatly blessed. One more time. I am highly favored, deeply loved, and greatly blessed. And you got to know it. And you got to believe it. What's more important than what the world says or what your past says is what God says. He has the final word. And if he wants to label you highly favored, deeply loved, and greatly blessed, that's his business because you belong to him. And that's his heart for you. And Paul says, man, we stand by grace and the end of that verse, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That's the new life we have because of God's goodness. Hope of God's glory in our lives. God working 
in our lives. And for those of you that just, you may, you may have some things in your past that are just so hard to get over. Either things that you've done or things that have been done to you. I want to ask you this question. What would you say is the top amongst the worst sins that could be committed? I think a lot of people would say murder. You know, different kinds of murder. Depends who you're murdering, how you're murdering. But, I mean, that's pretty bad. When you decide if someone else is going to live or die and you take their life from them. Very serious. We are studying in Romans chapter 5, which was written from a murderer. Paul used to put people to death. Not only that, he was a terrorist in the fact that he put people to death in the name of God. More than that, he put Christians to death in the name of God. Paul killed people. And this is the man who has so much regret. So much, I mean, he took people's lives away from them. When he was wrong, looking back, it's like, man, I was the one that was wrong. And I took their lives away. You know how hard it must be for Paul to go on with his life? What enabled him to go on? What enabled him to get past his past and actually live in abundance and use that to minister to countless generations, even minister to us today? The answer is the grace of God. And if God's grace was powerful enough for Paul and his murder, it's powerful enough for you and whatever you have done. But I don't deserve it, you say. That's why it's called grace. It's not about what you deserve. It's about God's goodness. And it takes some humility, doesn't it, to receive God's grace? And to say, wow, Lord, I admit, I need some help. I can't do this. I'm the one that got myself into this mess. There's no way I can trust myself to get myself out. I'm the problem. So Lord, thank you. It takes a lot of humility to receive God's grace and his forgiveness and the blessing that he wants to bestow upon you in the future. Some of you, the reason I'm talking about this is because you have not been able to forgive yourself. Maybe others have forgiven you. Maybe you believe that God has forgiven you, but you haven't forgiven yourself and you haven't received that forgiveness. You haven't allowed yourself to live forgiven. I want to tell you that that's wrong. You need to allow yourself to be forgiven. It's by His grace. You don't have to deserve the forgiveness. You just have to recognize, I need it. I don't want this to continue perpetuating itself. So in all humility, I'm going to receive this forgiveness because I need it. And that's what this is all about. And if it can happen for Paul, it can happen for you. Verse 3. Not only that, Paul goes on. It's like he's just adding one more incredible thought after another. We also glory in tribulations. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Life is hard. Just because we have been justified does not mean we will not go through hard times, tribulations, trials, temptations. We still live in a fallen world. But God's promise is that he will use the junk that we have gone through to make us more like him and to lead us into the abundant life and so that we can help others. There's some great blessings that can come from our tribulations. One of them, Paul says, is is when you go through tribulations, it develops perseverance in you. That stick to itiveness. That mental fortitude. 
stuff, man, you're like, okay, now, now I know I can at least go through it, right? People who have never had any hard times, they're still going, I'm wondering what's going to happen when I go through it because I haven't been tested yet. You can thank God and you can praise God and you can even glory in the fact that, wow, I'm, I've gone through some hard stuff, but I'm persevering. I'm having the attitude of someone victorious. I haven't let it beat me. That's a good thing. And that perseverance, Paul says, leads to character. It builds character, this stuff that we go through. I watched an interview with Lance Armstrong and Oprah Winfrey that took place when he came clean about his performance-enhancing drugs. How many of you saw that interview or heard about Lance's story? Most of you. This was a guy who was one of the greatest heroes in sports. Seven-time Tour de France winner, cancer survivor, developed the Live Strong Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization to help other people who are struggling with cancer and, and help them have a surviving attitude. Incredible, incredible individual. Was accused of using uh, performance-enhancing drugs, blood doping, and that kind of a thing. And he denied it all along and even accused other people, even sued other people. And then finally, he confessed. I did use performance-enhancing drugs. And overnight, Lance Armstrong went from hero to zero. And he will be seen in a different light forever. There's no changing that. And I was intrigued by this. I was given this interview by a friend here at Vinia because I can relate to much of what Lance Armstrong's going through. Many people will never see me in the same light. So it's like, man, what are this? Let me, let me learn from this guy, you know? Because on the scale that he's dealing with is even bigger. And at the end of the interview, Oprah Winfrey asked him this question. She said, what do you think is the moral to this story? And Lance Armstrong said, I'm not sure yet. Which to me was a very sad thing. It's like, I don't even know totally what God's trying to teach me in all this. He's learned several things, and, and, but you know he hasn't quite figured it all out. And she said, well, do you want to know what I think the moral of the story is? And he's like, yeah, sure. And Oprah said, the truth shall set you free. You had lived under those lies and trying to cover up for so long, and now you're free. You've got to deal with the consequences, but your conscience is clear. And then she said, do you know what I hope for you in all of this, Lance? And he's like, what, what's that? And Oprah's statement helped me to realize why she's so successful and what some of her genius is. I don't agree with all of Oprah's theology, so don't get me wrong here, but... She said something profound. She said, I just pray that as a result of all this, that you become a better person than you were before. And there's just something that resonates with all of us in that, isn't there? It's like, yeah, you know, you need to learn from your mistakes and hopefully you become better than you were before. That that tribulation leads to perseverance and perseverance to character. Because if you don't grow from it, you don't learn from it, it's like now it's just adding salt to the wound. Not only have you hurt a bunch of people, but you haven't even gotten it yet. And that's what life's all about, to learn and to grow. I had a lady come up to me a few weeks ago here at Venia, and she, and she looked at me with just these eyes of love and compassion. She said, Gary, you're not the same anymore, are you? And I said to her, I hope not. I hope I've learned from some of my mistakes and all that I've gone through, and I hope that I've grown from it. Because it's hard to know that I've let so many people down and hurt so many people because of some of my faults and failures. And she said, well, I see a difference in you. I see someone who's more humble than before and more compassionate before. 
and I see some beauty in you like I've never seen. And I'll tell you what, that was one of the greatest compliments that I had ever received. Because before, I felt like, in a sense, I was better than most people. And I wanted to be better than most people because it gave me a sense of security and significance. And so I strove to be the best, you know. I wasn't leaning upon God's grace. I wasn't in the, in the mindset of, oh, wow, it's all by your good grace. It was all, hey, Gary's doing good. Gary's so successful, you know. And when you act like that, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of pride that goes with it. And I've learned that it's pride that comes before the fall. All of our sins, whatever they may be, are infused with pride. It may be pride and anger, pride and lust, pride and judgmentalism, whatever, but there's always an element of pride. And I'm not going to stand up and say, hey, I'm not a, I don't have any more pride left in my life. But I hope that I can stand before God and before those that I know and love and look myself in the mirror and say, you know what? I'm learning. And I'm growing and I'm trying to apply the grace of God to my life and not just stay in my past, but learn from my past. As Paul said, this one thing I do, forgetting that which is behind and reaching forward to that which is ahead. You cannot lay hold of your future until you let go of your past. But if Paul could do it, you and I can do it as well. Those tribulations lead to perseverance, but perseverance to character and character to hope. Hey, there's life after failure. There's life after tribulation. I've been hurt. Someone's hurt me. There's life after that. God can bring healing to all of that. And that is good news. Amen? And notice he says, this hope, verse 5, does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That's what it's all about. We were created to be in a love relationship with God. And if we learn the lessons God's trying to teach us, his love will grow in our hearts. Our love for God will grow and our love for people will grow by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. That's the acid test. Where is our love at? Well, we're going to get into some more of this uh, as we continue in our study. I'm going to stop there because there's so much amazing stuff in these next few verses. I don't want to rush through it. And um, we're going to have communion this morning. But let me, just, uh, let me just read you a couple of verses to get you chewing on it for next week in verse 6. When we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die... Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, Paul's saying, you know, someone might die for the best of someone, but hardly anybody's going to die for the worst type of person out there. But Jesus died for all the ungodly, for all the sins throughout the whole world. And more than that, it says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in the act of sinning, Jesus died on the cross for us. How is that possible when you and I weren't even born yet? Because God lives outside of the time domain. He sees the past, the present, and the future. That's why he can prophesy about the future. That's why when Peter said, I will never deny you, the Lord's like, I love your heart, Peter, but actually you're going to deny me tonight. I know the future. And so that you know that I know, when you deny me the third time, I'm going to have a rooster crow. God knows not only your past sins, not only your present sins, God knows all the sins you're going to commit in the future. And he sees them all at one time if he wants to. It was with all your worst baggage, your worst carnality happening that Jesus said, I still love you and I'm willing to die for you to get you back. That's amazing. That's amazing grace. 